Uh, thanks so much, Colleen. Like, ditto. It's been it's been really amazing to work with with you guys in the battery, and uh, the past few weeks have been really transformative. And if if you don't mind turning on your video, because I love like this is how we meet each other these days. So of course, if like Meredith. <laughs> Mary the Sadler. So if you are able to open your video, um, that would be really great so that I can get to, I can just see you too. Yeah. So, um, do you hear it? Of, what? Oh, I can't see anything but myself. It oh, keeps really? Anyone it's, else having technical issues? It's just saying waiting, 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 but I see myself. Can everyone else see me or are there other people that you see me? I can see everyone. Okay. Huh. Oh, hi. Hi, Mary Carmen. Deb, you what? might want to log off and then log back in. It may be. Uh, that might work. Yeah. All right. I'll try that. We'll see you yeah. soon. So, yeah, it's, I just I so appreciate how much work the battery and Colleen have, have done to keep conversations going that are both urgent and around social environmental awareness and justice. So it's been such an, an honor to collaborate with you on events. And I really appreciate all the work that you put into this. And uh, when I sent Colleen the description for this talk, it was, I think maybe like a day or two before the shootings in Atlanta. And it really, really sort of, you know, I have to frame this talk around that because as I was sending her the information for this talk, um, that happened and I was like, whoa, can we do something about that? <laughs> and, and so these two sort of conversations were sort of generated at the same time. And it's reframed this talk for me, both bringing my own awareness to how I am an Asian woman <laughs> And I can't not speak to that, or I can't not be aware of how my voice as an Asian woman speaking about these topics is relative to the social climate right now. And so that's one thing. Another thing is, as I've been collaborating with The Battery and, and other friends on events around Stop Asian Hate, a good friend of mine, who's also my writing coach, was like, Jessica, you're always holding space for others what about yourself? Like, are you giving yourself time to heal? And so uh, with the encouragement of my, of my friends and you can say a practice that I've had, I, um, I just completed a week long healing personal retreat last week. So I was in silence for a week. And it was the first time really since I've given birth to a little baby, he's now three years old, little baby. <laughs> And it was really extraordinary. And so this talk, I was just coming out of silence on Sunday. And so this talk, I'm really trying to keep as um, close to the energy of that space as possible. And what happened in that retreat for me was really looking at how I need to connect to my power, connect to my voice. And I started to see, among other things, how I had adapted protections in sort of growing up in a white male dominated society where I was always other. And so two things that I noticed that I do when I present, I'm gonna actively try not to do in this talk that's forthcoming. And so I noticed one thing I, I do is that I always like to prepare slides because uh, I'm a very visual person, but also because I never really felt stepping into my voice fully. And so this is the first talk I've given on Zoom where there's no slides. And that's actually a, a, like a big thing for me because I actually like the safety of having this beautiful graphic on because I'm an artist. So I like, I sort of hide behind my graphics and then I'm just the little pixel on the side. So I've deliberately, now I just have my words and my face and that's a deliberate choice um, coming from the work I've done in the past few weeks of really stepping into that space. And the other thing that I've received feedback on 
is that I use really big words. My writing coach was like, Jessica, you use like fancy words. <laughs> like, why do you do that? And, and I was like, oh my God, that's this thing I adapted to sound right. oh, smart. Oh, now wait a second. I can't do that. Oh, I'll mute you. To sound smart and important. <laughs> and it's like this academic jargon shield so that I would somehow have more power or something like that. And I was like, you know, I don't need that. So I'm gonna actively try not to use academic jargon or language that is part of the institutions that I was raised in and had to do academic intellectual battle in and just sort of soften out of that identity as well. And so those two are gonna be informing this talk. And at the end, we will have a meditation and Q&A. So, yeah. One more thing, just in terms of uh, framing this. I've also reclaimed my Chinese name. <laughs> and so I've put it on my Instagram, which was like a, a big healing moment for me. So I'm just going to say it. Gong jie xi. And I'm wearing my grandmother's blazer as ancestor acknowledgement as well. So Gong is my family name and Jie Xi is Chinese for Jessica. Jie Xi means celebration in the West. And so it, um, it's really powerful even just for me to say it. So I'm going to do my best in this talk to do something that I haven't normally done in talks, which is be as vulnerable and open. And instead of having a slide deck that takes you through my theses, I'm actually going to tell you the story of consciousness, creativity, and AI as a story of my life, because it's my life. I mean, when, when people say, oh my God, you did you did 450 days of silence. That's amazing. And it's really hard to say, like, it's not amazing, like it's my life. Like meditation is not a hobby. It is not something I do to feel more relaxed. Um, I really can't distinguish between consciousness practices, going into those spaces and how I've chosen to live my life. And um, so it'll start there. How did consciousness, how did I come to a place of such deep commitment to meditation whereby I ended up doing a year and a half silent meditation retreat? It didn't just come out of nowhere. And um, I think it, I realize now what a courageous act of resistance it is and continues to be. Because um, at the time, I was 27 years old, and I was preparing to do a year and a half long silent retreat with my husband. And we were just at, you know, another party. And as usual, a wedding party, people are like, oh, what, what are you, you know, when you're at a wedding party, people are very casual, like, oh, what do you do? Where are you going? And this person, you know, is like, Jessica, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm preparing to go into silence for three years. And they're like, what? <laughs> it's not really like what you expect. And he had the best response, which was not to judge me, not to be like WTF or like, you're amazing. He just said something that really like illuminated the act of resistance. He just said, how interesting. Everyone else is trying to do something and you're trying to do nothing. <laughs> and I was like, huh, am I? And I think um, my response to working too hard at Yale, <laughs> finding a way to bring my spiritual practice into my life, it, it just became um, around my senior year at Yale it became inextricable from my way of life. And I think a few of you here may have been part of that journey. 
I know Meredith was there when I was teaching. Oh, I think she left when I was teaching at Yale um, meditation. And I started a group called Yogis at Yale. And actually when I graduated, when I was 21, I went to Tibet and um, they always say this. I went to all these monasteries and then the day, literally like, I'd say the week I got back to New York, I met my spiritual teacher who had come from one of the monasteries I had visited, but he was no longer in the monastery. He was in New York City. <laughs> so it was like, I went on that pilgrimage. It, it awakened some kind of karma I had with those spiritual lineages. And my teacher was meeting me. He actually came to my yoga studio. He was giving a talk there on a yoga sutra. And it was just like, I graduated college and I began my serious studies of Buddhism. And that was a 10 year training program. So I never really had a job. <laughs> I went from being in school to basically um, being a renunciate. So working for free to serve the Dharma and uh, teaching and studying at the same time and raising money to do a deep silent retreat because in the Buddhist system, you learn, um, you can say the open teachings and you train, and then you do the secret teachings. And then your PhD dissertation is your go into silence for three years. So you can practice everything you just learned. <laughs> so that's just the system. Like you don't present to a thesis board, you, you, you do it on yourself, but it's like you've mastered the teachings before you go into silence so that you know what you're doing. And so it was a marathon of training. So before we did the year and a half, it was about twice a year, I would spend a month in silence. So two months in silence to even just work up to the mental stamina where you wouldn't go crazy, right? Cause it actually takes a lot of mental strength and boundaries to, cause it's not safe if you just go from zero to like all in. And so somewhere along the way um, I met my husband, <laughs> he was leading a death awareness meditation retreat in LA. His name is Stefan Dreyfus and he had hired me to teach yoga. And at the time he was also the assistant editor of the bachelor reality television show, just as an aside, <laughs> right? My life story is funny and it's necessary because like consciousness, why am I talking about consciousness? Um, so here's this like Buddhist teacher who's uh, working on the Bachelor reality television show. And uh, two days after we met, we were co-teaching this death awareness meditation retreat. And we, um, it was like we'd been together forever. We, were, we just stepped into co-facilitating one of these really deep spaces for people. And I think at the end of the retreat, he just he just popped the question. The question wasn't, will you marry me? The question was, will you do a three-year retreat with me? <laughs> so, so that's what like, you know, in love Buddhists say to each other when they want to propose. Um, <laughs> I know it's funny, right? Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's what happened. And I was like, so shocked. I just said, yes. And um, so that began the journey. It was like a three-year journey to prepare for the three-year retreat because it begins by like raising money. We had to build our cabin. We had to set up funding. We had to set up food. Um, we had to tell our parents. And this is all about just creating the consciousness so that we can enter into an unobstructed landscape of human consciousness where we could actually use the tools that we had been trained in for eight years and start to investigate the nature of of consciousness. And uh, like all 20 year olds, I think I was 27, he was like 30 something. <laughs> uh, we had the difficult task of trying to explain what we were doing to our parents. So that in itself is like a television series. <laughs> okay. So, you know, most people maybe have difficulty explaining what they're doing to their parents, but try explaining this to your non-Buddhist parents. I mean, mine are at least Chinese. So they were just like, Jessica, can you wait till you retire? Because it's a Bud it is a Chinese tradition to go into the mountains when you have become successful and you have your kids, then you go on a mountain retreat, you know, 
And they're like, Jessica, can't you just wait till you're like 65? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> You know, it really has to be now because I have this vision that in order to give what I want to give to the world, I need this information before I'm 65, right? Like, I really feel like this is what I need now. So that was me talking to my parents for two years in a nutshell. Now, where does AI come in? Right here. Um, my father's parents were a little bit more challenging. <laughs> So I had somehow married into um, a Western phenomenology lineage. So uh, Hubert L. Dreyfus is my father-in-law and he is one of the um, foremost Western experts uh, on phenomenology, Heidegger, existentialism, been teaching philosophy forever <laughs> and phenomenal man also one of the earliest critics of artificial intelligence and he wrote the book what computers can't do what computers still can't do and so um i fell into this conversation of having to not explain to my in-laws what i was doing with their son but debate them philosophically as to why what i was doing was important at all <laughs> So my introduction to Western phenomenology, I mean, I'd read it in school, but it's different when you have to explain why you're going with their son to a meditation retreat and how all they're trying to do is tell you that it's wrong. And all, all you're trying to do is explain to them why consciousness is the most important thing and why you have the tools for it and he doesn't. <laughs> so the stakes are really high. And um, there are certain dinner conversations where I was like, I got to record this because <laughs> I was just watching my husband and his father do battle. It was just intellectual battle of quoting this, referencing that. Da, 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 da. And we, we got down to like certain lines of Kant where we were just all broke down. <laughs> and it's like, this is where the argument breaks down. This is why you can't talk about metaphysics, my child. <laughs> And it, through that discovery, we also discovered that's why you can't talk about metaphysics in university because of Kant, by the way. <laughs> um, and it illuminated to me the landscape, the intersection of consciousness, right? Here was this expert on Western philosophy of mind. And here was his son who actually in his own life's choices was resisting his father's legacy and was saying, hey, I don't think you know everything. <laughs> I'm going to go meditate. And um, what ended up happening was we never convinced each other. He was adamant that we were wrong. We were wasting our lives. And um, we were not convinced. We just, and I continue to think that he's wrong. <laughs> right? And there was really only one thing that we agreed on and that we still agree on which is I love his critique of artificial intelligence. <laughs> I think it's brilliant, right? It's, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's what he's known for. And um, what I realize is that my love for philosophy, right? Love of wisdom, my father-in-law's love of philosophy, love of wisdom, Western and Eastern love, we're joined in our love for humanity and we do battle together in the conversation around AI. We're allies in that conversation <laughs> makes sense right it's like both sides of the traditions each have their own arguments around the impact of artificial intelligence and how we can evolve with it and the issues that we need to be talking about and um it's an unlikely uh, discovery, <laughs> but uh, just as a frame, this is where I'm coming from when I talk about consciousness, creativity, and artificial intelligence, and when I say that it's my life. <laughs> that's why you're like, how can she say that? It's like that's how it. That's how. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to give you a little briefing on what the argument of uh, the critique of artificial intelligence is from the Hubert Dreyfus point of view. So it's a very long and very dense book and it came out in the 70s. It's been re-released as what computers still can't do. 
Oh, there's people in the waiting room. Admit all. And uh, just the heart of the critique that Professor Dreyfus lays out is against what's called GoFi, good old fashioned artificial intelligence, which back in the 70s was the only kind of artificial intelligence there, there was, which was actually trying to create a human intelligence in a robot form. And so the, the central thesis of his book was that it was impossible. And the implication was stop funding it, <laughs> right? That's why he was such a threat to the AI community. Here was this MIT philosophy guy who then ended up going to Berkeley saying, this is a waste of your time, i.e. stop throwing money at it. <laughs> but he was saying it's impossible because you can't solve the problem of the frame, the context, common sense. In other words, robots don't know what it means to be human. They have no context, no common sense frame from which to contextualize the information that they input. Um, I can read the summary, but I won't bore you with that. <laughs> it's not boring, it's, it's fascinating. But if you want to get dig deeper into the details of that, there's plenty online. And it's a profound argument. And I, I fully resonate with it on many levels. And my work now as an artist and educator and facilitator is very much around working with context and providing context and amplifying that part of our humanness. And so what's the big deal about this? Well, Bert was right. <laughs> they could not create that kind of artificial intelligence. And so what happened was after years and years of, you can say experiments, failed uh, experiments, they, they directed their research more towards not trying to replicate human intelligence, but what's now known as machine learning, pattern learning, um, neural networks, right? As looking at what they could get a robot to do. And in a sense, they actually admitted failure that they could not do their original, uh, what, they, what the position was in the 70s. And so here's why this is so important historically. So his critique influenced the direction of research, or you can say that it was failed to begin with that particular avenue of research actually fueled the success of the current movement around machine learning and deep neural networks. The other reason why this is significant is because what the AI community did in response to the critique and their failure <laughs> was to not admit failure. The AI community never said, Hubert Dreyfus is right and we are wrong and we have redefined our hypothesis and we will prove this new hypothesis correct. Instead, what they did was they changed the goalposts and did something which has never really been called out but we're gonna start calling them out on it which is they actually lowered the bar on what intelligence is. That's what they did. That is profound. Instead of admitting that they couldn't replicate human intelligence, they lowered the bar on how they define what intelligence is. Okay, who cares that it's about robots or it's about their ego and not wanting to admit failure? It's the fact that their rebranding of artificial intelligence actually rebranded intelligence. So how does that then seed the impact on how humans understand what they are capable of in their own intelligence? And so it creates this downward spiral <laughs> of because we cannot create the immense power of human intelligence, we're gonna lower the bar on what intelligence is so that we can replicate this part of human intelligence. And then humans look at intelligence and they lower to meet what is now the new bar, new lower bar for intelligence. And it goes like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's in a nutshell, what was set in motion in the seventies and in the eighties. From what I've learned uh, hanging out with my father-in-law and these conversations. And so um, how have 
we lowered the bar on intelligence. That's one way, right? By saying that machine learning, pattern learning, that somehow recognizing patterns is a form of intelligence. I mean, it, it is. So I'm just gonna, there's many, many, many different ways that I've observed and I'm not gonna list them all now, but I'm just gonna list one, which I think is a really big one. And this is really where you can say my work with Buddhist meditation traditions intersects with neuroscience. Because right now it's all the rage for Buddhist meditators to have nodes put on their brains and mapped out by like neuro <laughs> neuroscientists and um, like Adam Ghazali's lab, which is doing this really incredible work. And it's, it's really in vogue right now. And it's both helpful and harmful. And I think it's really important to talk about both, right? It's helpful because you're using Western medical science to quote unquote prove things that Eastern traditions have always known. It's, it's hurtful in the sense that when you, because you're lowering the bar on intelligence by saying, well, intelligence is connected to the organ of the brain and intelligence is just your neurons firing. That's all intelligence is. That's all consciousness is. So what happens when you do that? That's the implication, right? What happens when you limit intelligence to the firing of neurons? You just disconnected intelligence from spirit. You've decided that intelligence is matter and you've divorced it from spirit. Right? You can't measure spirit. So the word for spirit in Latin is genius. You're quite literally severing humanity from genius. That's massive. <laughs> the implications of that is massive. The common assumption that intellect is housed in the physical matter of the brain cuts you off etymologically from genius, but also energetically from spirit. That somehow your intelligence has nothing to do with the soul or the spirit. It's just neurons firing in your brain. <laughs> so for a meditator, that's like, it's like such a tiny part of how I connect with my mind, right? <laughs> I'm like, how can you limit it to just what is measurable on a screen? And so um, people always ask me, you know, what did you learn from deep meditation? Or, you know, like what happened? And I'm always like, whatever gets pulled out of me by you in this particular moment is whatever you're gonna <laughs> get from that particular experience that you need to hear right now. Cause I don't even really know what I learned, it's simply a state of being, of, uh, I'd say it's a conviction in one's own presence of being, which is deeply rooted in the experience of being human, right? I guess that's what I learned. <laughs> but it's a lot of time actually watching your mind operate, right? You're not measuring your mind. You're not even observing your mind. It's even like you're co-creating your mind with your mind. That's the best way to describe it. A deep meditation retreat of that duration with the tools that I was given is the process of co-creating your mind with your mind. And the, the insight that I'm gonna share with you today that's directly relevant to, I think the future of human consciousness to sum up is the observation of a meditator that intelligence is not a result. Intelligence is seeded. Intelligence is a seed. Right? We're so fixated on results, evidence, measurable things. We forget that the mind is a cause thing. It comes from causes. And when you sit for that long with your mind, you stop seeing results and you start living in the world of seeds and causation. And you start to understand that the mind is a changing thing. There's not such a thing 
as a fixed human consciousness or a fixed human capacity or a fixed human mind. And so you understand why things like artificial intelligence, what was the human mind in the 70s has been altered <laughs> by the technologies that have been created since then. Because we're constantly, our minds are so responsive to how we've seeded it culturally, personally. And most of us are not aware of how we are seeding the future of our own minds or of the future of humanity's consciousness. And so the process of meditating is a process of watching mental seeds, also known as mental imprints. It's like every thought you have, everything you see, everything you read, it creates an imprint in your mind, like it plants a seed. And then over duration, you watch those seeds flower. They become results. It goes seed result, right? And then there's a new seed that's planted. And then that seeds another result. And the process of meditation is almost like watching the mental seeds arise. <laughs> and then you sometimes you see results and you see how they were caused. Uh, the word for this cycle is sometimes called karma. Right? It's, it's uh, action and its consequences. And you, you observe how your mind is the result of previous moments of mind. Your mind is caused by previous moments of mind. <laughs> and it becomes a chain that becomes your stream of consciousness. We'll do a little meditation at the end of this. But um, yeah, seed result, seed result. So how does this relate to creativity? Oh, what's wrong? Nikki, you have a question? Yes, oh, that's a great drawing, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have room for, for questions that we will have room for questions at the end, but thank you for sharing that drawing. How does this impact how we are created by what we make? <laughs> so another way to say that is we make a thing, we're made by it. 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 They seed each other. <laughs> and uh, when you start to look at the cycle of creativity as this constant mirroring of seed and result, it gives a different perspective to how you even read Wired Magazine. <laughs> so uh, when I told my mother-in-law that I was working on this you know, talk, she started sending me Wired, she follows Wired. And so she sent me you know, the latest Wired Magazine like you know, newsletter. And it was about this company called Scribe AI that is trying to solve the problem of, of memory, scribe AI. And, you know, like all wired language, they're really excited about their technology. It's really great. They're like, oh my God, this is also the best thing to happen on this planet, <laughs> right? That's like, I don't know, there's like over, over enthusiasm of everything. And um, so just to read you this, this very bit, so it's um, this, this entrepreneur is named Dan, and uh, he suffers from something called aphantasia, which is the inability to visualize images. And so this blindness in his mind's eye makes remembering things very difficult. And so this discovery um, led him to want to create a technology to help himself, right? He, and so he was inspired as we are by our own need for solutions, by the shape of our own bodies and minds to then make something. It's, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful human um, trait and desire that create that innate creativity that's, that's this resilience to something that could be debilitating. He was like, I can invent something. And so this discovery led him to do deeper research on memory and basically became a startup called Scribe AI, where he is now hoping to supplement our neurons. And basically the long-term ambition is to provide perfect recall of every memory for everyone to help you remember everything. And I was like, ah, 
<laughs> it's like, please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> and then what I immediately saw was like a bunch of people that have no memory. And I'm just like, how do you fail to see that? It's like, yes, I understand that this is a beautiful personal passion, but what are you setting in motion? And then my husband was like, ah, it's not gonna work. Like he's got to figure out a lot of stuff which you can't figure out. But I was like, that's not the point. The point is how people are even learning to articulate their pilots and these ideas. It's like, why is that? How can they not see that if he's creating this in reference to his own memory problems, he's in effect seeding humanity with his same memory problems. <laughs> And I was like, how is that not immediately obvious to whatever team he's hired to do his branding <laughs> or his coworkers? It's like, when you do future narrative research as to what is the trajectory of your business, how is that seed not immediately obvious in terms of what kind of impact is your technology going to have? And why are we not asking these questions? Why is Wired Magazine not even like considering, well, hmm. <laughs> because we are so fixated on results. We're so fixated on how do we solve the problem? We don't understand how our problem is setting in motion a new seed, right? And so how do we bring this consciousness to everything that we make, right? So this is what um, the studio that we're forming right now is, is called, Make Conscious. How do we become conscious of how everything that we make is a seed for the future of our minds, of our consciousness, of humanity? Because we don't realize how powerful we are. I've seen this with so many entrepreneurs that I've had the privilege of working with. Like it's always a great honor to, to have the trust of someone to bring you into their process of developing these products and solutions that have huge impact like they don't realize that if they're wildly successful they could actually create a lot of damage <laughs> like they just because they almost they don't even believe they're so fixated on the problems that need to be solved to even get to milestone one that they're not at a place of what the buddhist was called result refuge which is just assume you've already gotten to the end and look back, what have you done, right? So I feel like this should just be something that every entrepreneur, entrepreneur does. Instead of starting with the assumption, I'm not even gonna make it to series A, right? Assume you are series E <laughs> and you are Uber and you look back at your legacy and you're like, what have I done? And that should happen before you even raise your first seed round. Right, that's, that's how I would apply my meditation in a year and a half to how we do uh, product <laughs> life cycles right now, is that you need to get out of this little rat race of seed result, seed result, seed result, and just look at, okay, just switch places. You're, when you're in the seed stage, you're looking at the result. Well, just pretend you're in the result phase and look at the seed. And I think that could help humanity a lot if, if we started to bring this just best practice to, to how we innovate our technologies. So um, this cycle of seed result, result seed, the cycle of making and being made by the thing is what you can say changes the paradigm. It changes the idea of the thing. So there's a word for this. And it's a word that I learned from going to a weekend event where it's called the American Society of Existential Philosophers, but it's really my father-in-law's friends talking to each other with geeky papers that they prepared. <laughs> and I heard this brilliant talk by Sean Kelly, who at the time was, um, he still is, he teaches philosophy at Harvard. And uh, this idea of the cycle of making and being made causing a paradigm shift. 
the Greek word that he terms that is techne. Techne, it's a foil to episteme, which is a skill and craft. But techne is this type of paradigm shifting making is of course the root of technology, right? Techne logos, technology. And it is imperative to me that we go to the origin of these words as we understand how we are making these things with these ideas, right? So, um, yeah, I'm gonna read something that, that Sean wrote, I think is very, he wrote a beautiful article that was in the MIT Technology Review. He sent to me when I asked him uh, if he had anything for me to read to prepare for this talk. <laughs> and he sent me this great article. And he basically argues for why uh, AI can never recreate human creativity. But he makes one frightening assumption, which is that human intelligence and human creativity can't change, right? So that's where my husband and my father-in-law disagree. In Buddhism, we're very, very big on impermanence and how all things are changing. Western philosophy somehow thinks that the mind is a fixed thing, <laughs> that the human intelligence is just going to be, there's like some kind of ground of being. And when he sit, when in this beautiful article where he argues for how AI can never defeat human creativity and he cites all of these artists and philosophers and extraordinary pieces of artwork, I'm like, well, that's assuming that we don't seed the creativity out of ourselves. <laughs> and we're on the way to do that right now. And so he writes this. Uh, in 2016, no, I think this was last year. Creativity is one of the defining features of human beings. The capacity for genuine creativity, the kind of creativity that updates our understanding of the nature of being, that changes the way we understand what it is to be beautiful or good or true. That capacity is the ground of what it is to be human. And then he quotes a writer, Ben Christian but he gives a warning. He's like, but <laughs> human beings are starting to act less like beings who value creativity as one of our highest possibilities and are becoming more like machines themselves. So I see this all the time. And so he's not talking about it in terms of seeds. He uses the word value. And so I was recently involved in um, the development of the Yale Schwartzman Center which was a generous donation by Stephen Schwartzman. And um, just, you know, a couple hundred million. And then like a year later, he donated twice that amount to artificial intelligence. So the Schwartzman Center is for the humanities. And then he turned around and donated twice that for AI at MIT. And a friend of mine who's on, um, who's friends with people on the Yale core board was horrified. Why are we valuing humanities as half artificial intelligence? That's our future right there. It's just look at the numbers, look at where the money's going. That's why the word value is so critical. Our philanthropic dollars, our investment is not going into the humanities, it's going to de de developing artificial intelligence. And so we're seeding it. We're literally seeding it. And so, you know, what are we supposed to do? What am I as an artist meditator uh, supposed to do? Well, for one thing, this, start talking about it, just letting you guys know the ideas that, I'm, that are percolating in my mind, start conversations about this, which lead to hopefully more funding for the humanities and less funding for AI. <laughs> Right. Um, no, no, you can fund AI, but please just fund it in a way that <laughs> brings into all account all of these things. But what we urgently need to do is stop this uh, reading the tone of Wired magazine. There's this like little kid innocent embrace of artificial intelligence. Like it's this like super exciting thing. But when I look at 
the Capitol insurrection, what's what's going on right now with social media, I'm like, it should just be called AI artificial ignorance. Like it just amplifies hate because it has no discrimination. It just takes whatever algorithm you give it and it gives you more. And so if the airwaves are full of anti-Asian rhetoric or like crazy uh, QAnon stuff, artificial ignorance thinks that's great. It's saying yes. <laughs> and it's going to give you more. And um, we are doing nearly, we're not even starting to scratch the surface of, of responding to that, responding to the implications of that, to how we're just beginning. The cycles of disinformation are just in their, in their infancy right now. And I was reading some terrifying article that, I mean, if anything is the downfall of democracy, it's that we don't know what's true or false anymore because the algorithms have taken over. <laughs> and that's terrifying. Um, so I don't mean to scare you, I'm here to give you hope, <laughs> but I need to instill in you a sense of urgency because I feel a lot of it. Um, because why I, why I meditated for three years, it became a year and a half, which is another story, is, um, is because I've always felt a sense of urgency, how there's nothing more urgent than consciousness because of how I see what's happening in the world. And so I feel the need now as much as I did 10 years ago to seed phenomenal mind, your phenomenal mind, to connect people to genius, their own genius, their own humanity. And so how do you do that? I'm not here just to like rile you up. <laughs> I have seeds for your mind. <laughs> so, um, it's not quite a step-by-step -step plan, but it's some of the tools that we've developed as a, as a collective, a community. The community is called Make Conscious, and it began around a year ago with COVID. And when I started to teach meditation online every day <laughs> uh, for the last year, and um, those meditations led to this uh, formation of a group of us that are working actively around these issues. And so one of the first things we need to do is to reclaim our minds. And I use the word reclaim because it also has the connotation of reclaiming land right? and the work that we do around decolonization. Just the way we need to decolonize land, we need to decolonize our minds. We need to reclaim that real estate <laughs> and understand what sovereignty is for your own mind. So when people are like, what happens when you meditate for that long? You reestablish, you reclaim your mind. It's profound. Just that being able to say, you know, I reclaimed my mind. I didn't have internet for a year and a half. I didn't have a phone for a year and a half. I, <laughs> I took back that piece of real estate <laughs> and I owned it, right? So we don't realize how much we've given up of our mental real estate. We just aren't aware of it. When you start meditating, you actually start realizing how bad it really is. And so one of my meditation teachers actually says, when you first start, it feels like it gets worse before it gets better. Cause you're actually just aware of how bad the problem is. <laughs> and uh, the next step after reclaiming like your mental real estate is you actually have to reclaim your genius, your spirit. We, part of our relationship to technology has become an unwitting dependence on it, um, a loss of agency, a loss of connection to spirit and a loss of connection to our own genius. And so this is a process. How do you reconnect to genius as spirit, as the spiritual aspects of your intelligence? And all of that process, that differentiation of your genius and the genius of the technology that you're collaborating with, you start to become super aware of how all of your technology is the product of someone else's genius and you're letting their genius overrun your real estate. 
And so you develop boundaries, you discover boundaries, you consciously create edges, and that process allows you to create agency, right? That's the key. When you have agency, you have no power until you have agency. You have no agency until you've reclaimed your mind. <laughs> and so for me, I'm not a critic of AI. I mean, I guess I'm a critic of AI, but I'm a critic of everything. <laughs> it's that um, I embrace AI. I think it's really important that you guys understand that I'm like, I'm a big fan of things like Tesla. I've been driving one for four years and I bought Tesla stock back when it was $40 a share. So I'm like a geek too about this stuff. Like I love technology <laughs> and I don't, I'm not like, don't live with it. It's like, it's learning how to coexist with technology by learning to collaborate with genius, intermingling your genius with the genius of the technology and to create boundaries. And so, um, I made one slide, which I'm going to show you, because it's the slide for the course that is coming up very soon. And it's just a little map of what I just shared. So we've come up with tools. We're not, we're not just here to scare you, <laughs> but tools. So these are based on what I just said, but these are processes that I've developed over the years. I should say we've developed over the years because I've, through working with entrepreneurs as a consultant, advisor, designer, like these are the processes that we've sort of co-created. As they've asked questions, I've brought in the contemplative tools that I have. And we've come up with the first process is mapping, right? It's a discovering of context and I call it genius constellation where you look at where your idea both relates to your own personal genius and the genius of your immediate context. I don't like to use market because that's too like limiting. <laughs> and then after that process, but you can do both, this all applies to doing it on a personal level or at, at scale, right? You can do these as like company things. Then there's the frame, right? So after you, understand what you've got, you start to develop frames, edges, where you start to actually both see the structure that's already existing and actually clear the structure. So agency starts to come in where you're like, hmm, that's not what I want. And I didn't even know that was there until I started mapping it. And you start to actually create, you can say the fabric of consciousness. And when that agency starts to form, that's when transformation begins. I love the word transform. Trans is like to cross. <laughs> form, it like crosses over into form, from idea into form. And it becomes pathways. I'm calling it a choice matrix because it's like agency, agency. You keep acting with agency and it starts to create a whole nother um, foundation or um, weave. And then that weave is what becomes a new system, a new system for yourself, a new system for your mind, a new system for culture. That's where the paradigm shift starts to happen. And I'm calling this ornament, which is a whole nother conversation, but it's an architectural paradigm whereby systemic change becomes embedded in structural expression. Systemic change is embedded in structural expression. That's what ornament is. And that's what we need. <laughs> yeah. So we've got about five minutes left, but I'm happy to stay on. I wanted to uh, invite you all, each and every one of you to participate in these conversations that we are leading. This is going to be a course that starts in a few weeks, in next week. But also if anything that I've said is interesting, you wanna know more, it's like, we're open. We just want these ideas to get out there and see what other initiatives can arise. Um, so you can just contact me at makeconscious.com or create at makeconscious or put your email in the chat and I'll reach out to you or I'll add you to our list. So any questions before we go into the meditation comments?
happy, still here, confused, furrowing of brow. <laughs> no, you guys want a meditation now? Oh, Marissa gave me the thumbs up. <laughs> you have a question, Nikki? I don't have a question. I just wanted to say as a first comer to the group, uh, the larger group, um, whatever that is you went through is extraordinary. I'm so incredibly <laughs> blown away by how you were able to articulate, which seems like huge amounts of information, like quantum mechanically just went. <laughs> um, so I'm like very impressed. Um, I knew you were cool when I started. I didn't know quite how cool. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Oh my God, Nikki. I can't wait to meet how cool you are. <laughs> yeah. Mary Carmen, what do you have to say? See to believe. Oh, yeah. You want to share that? Please share that. That's how we met. Just quickly, because I want to go into the meditation and I want others also. <laughs> but this is the book that Jessica created right when she came out of her retreat. And that's when we met. And it's a little, it came in a little kit with a box um, to put your boundaries in your space and to learn to host silent retreats on your own, in your home. I've done around five of this. And oh. I, adore just Jessica's work and I am like yeah learning a lot from her dragon wisdom in the west <laughs> thank you thank you so much yeah so um yeah the, I'm gonna lead just a short five ten minute meditation and uh what's gonna happen is in a week's time I know a lot of you are already in the meditation program but we're gonna go through that syllabus that I just went through over the course of four weeks. And then we're going to meet together in a day long retreat where we're actually going to make a mind map. I'm calling it the Noli map of the mind. So the Noli plan is one of the super important maps in the history of urban planning. And it's a foundational map of Rome that actually shows the public and private spaces. And so you can actually see how the city breathes between public and private space. And what I've always wanted to do, and what I've done for myself is to make a Noli plan of my own mind with all these privacy issues, <laughs> but really just looking at how over the course of your life, the nuances of the public and the private space have changed. It's profound, right? And what that intimacy or lack of intimacy or boundaries or lack of boundaries that you've put or taken down has done to your psyche. And to give you agency around how you can have a say in what that is. So and we'll start now. So just uh, close your eyes or sit up tall or lie down if you like. We're just gonna start with the first process of mapping genius. So all a map is, is an accumulation of insights over time as they, they become a landscape. And then see if you can just let your thinking mind quiet down. And settle into a place of observation. So it's like you're shifting from actively seeding to the position of the gardener. You're just looking at the plot soil, your mind.
and just bring to mind the most compelling project you have in your little garden right now. The project that's really getting you excited. Could be a side project, it could be a main project at work. One that's really like, hmm, that's making me really excited. And instead of engaging with it the way you normally engage with that project, you're just like sitting on the side of the project, the gardener, and see if you can look at that project in its stage of growth. Is it in a seed stage? Is it in the result stage? Have you not even planted the seed? Is the seed in your hand? And just stay here in this positioning. It's not it so much detaching from the project as much as it is holding it. Hold your creativity. And experience it as you're holding it. This one particular seed. Observe it, feel it, admire it. And as you admire it, feel the spark that ignites your admiration, that passion. It's like a spirit around it. Right? The seed is defined often as the will to power. It has this inner energy, this potential. As you admire that which you have seated, see if you connect to that filament of energy inside of it. Everything comes from causes. As you connect to its energy, you connect to its story.
and you feel like a thread. Maybe it feels like a little root or a thread of energy. See if you can trace its pathway. It came from somewhere. You might, in a flash of insight, see the seed for the seed. Oh my God, it came from there. And that came from there. And there, and there, and there, and there. This is a slice of your genius. A window into how you seeded that passion project. And the first pathway on your map. So now just hold this observation, or you can keep going. And as you hold it, you are establishing yourself in your own frame, your own context. And that context, as you sit with it, allow it to ground, allow the insight to ground and to anchor in you. And it starts to become the seed for your next pathway, the seed for this work. And see if you can feel it's like a blessing, a joy, an invitation. To your phenomenal mind. And feel how significant it is. for you as an individual to just spend these five minutes doing this work and how that impacts human consciousness, what it means to be human. Thank you, fellow humans, for showing up. And whenever you're ready, you can come out. If you have a piece of paper, you could write what you just experienced.